1995 Acura Integra. GSR, shaved door handles. Yeah, you really can't open the doors. So this one came to us, it wouldn't even run. And uh, we replaced the distributor on it and it would run intermittently. And it was doing this issue where the main relay was clicking rapidly and other relays were clicking. And yeah, just it didn't sound good and the fuel pump didn't want to prime. And um, we thought at first it might have been the ignition switch. And then one day I flipped the ECU upside down because it was just laying here on the floor and it started working. And so I started going through the wiring harness and it had these old like stereo crimps in it. So I noticed the map sensor signal was not reading quite right. And as I was going through this troubleshooting this, uh, a ground or something dropped out. And then the ECU, once I powered it back on, stopped responding to serial. So about that. Okay, so this is the ECU from that Integra. It's an AEM Series 1, so the 1040. Uh, these go all the way back to the 90s, so they're pretty vintage at this point. <clears throat> and this wasn't responding. By the way, this is how these work. So this is like a universal ECU essentially, and then they design an adapter board. And so this one just happens to be for Honda. And you can see here it's got this dual row header, and this sandwich is in here like this. And these are a pain to get apart when you have a hundred pins stacked like that. But this is what it looks like when you separate the sandwich. And so on here we have a Freescale processor. This is Motorola 68000 based. Um, this is like a programmable processor for uh, injection and ignition control. Uh, this is the ROM where the firmware is stored. This is the RAM. <clears throat> and then underneath the ROM here uh, this is where the actual calibration is stored. So when you make changes to your tune, that's where it's stored on. All right, so after getting the board out, one of the first things you do is you figure out where the 12 volt power comes in. And so I looked up the data sheet for the voltage regulator, soldered a wire to the 12 volt input, and soldered another wire to ground. And so this way I can provide power from the bench power supply to uh, do further troubleshooting. So let's go ahead and power it up. I wish my microscope camera was here, but that's okay. So we have our data sheet that has the ROM pinout on it. And so what I'm going to go ahead and do is start pinning a couple lines. Here we can see that it's trying to read from the address lines. So let's go to the uh, chip select pin. So 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. And you can see there that it reads about eight pulses, six or eight pulses, um, and then stops. It's not a continuous thing. And so it's almost like it's looping. But this does show that our microcontroller is working. There's this uh, thing in there called a watchdog timer. And basically that watches the CPU. And if the CPU has any kind of error or is not executing correctly and it doesn't tell the watchdog timer every once in a while, hey, I'm alive, the watchdog timer will reset the processor. And so it's possible that it's stuck in this reset loop. And so what I did was I pulled up the data sheet for the microcontroller and I figured out which pin is the reset pin. And on this one, this will actually output the reset state uh, to that pin. And so if I go over here and I probe the reset pin, you can see that uh, it is fluctuating as well. All right, so I've readjusted the scope for a 10 millisecond time base. So if I go back and I probe our reset pin, you can see that the, the processor is continuously resetting. So since we have it attempting to read from the ROM and execute code, um, but it's not clearing the watchdog timer, uh, the next step is to examine the contents of the ROM. So let's do that. Okay, so on the screen we have the two firmware files up. The one on the right is the one pulled from this AEM ECU, and the one on the left is a good, known good firmware file. And when the CPU starts up, there's something called a reset vector, which is basically the address that the processor looks to to execute instructions. 
And they're usually either at the beginning, very beginning, or very end of a firmware file. And sometimes that can change depending on the CPU, but um, as you can see here at the very end, we have FF00, FF00, which doesn't make too much sense. Um, and if I jump to the beginning of the file here, it's all Fs. A blank chip will be all Fs, which is basically full of ones. Now, if we compare that with our good firmware file, you can see that at the very beginning here, we actually do have some instructions. There is some data there. And so if I go to the end, it's all Fs there. And you can see that we have uh, some other firmware information here. One of the interesting things here is this ECU actually isn't made by AEM. It's made by a company called GEMS. Um, and so basically AEM went to GEMS and said, hey, we want to rebrand your ECU and sell it as our own. And that's what they did. So these are the people that actually make uh, AEM ECUs. I don't know if they make the current ones, but at the very least, the version 1 and version 2 are made by GEMS. And so if I go through and compare some of this data, uh, you can actually see that uh, it's quite different. So if I, let me back all the way up to the top here. And so we'll go through the first 220 bytes or so are different. And you can see about the middle of the firmware file here, there's a difference. And then down here, where this, on the left here, this is literally like operating system code, we have this repeating pattern here. And the reason why this occurred is because this flash chip is electronically writable. It's not like a one-time program and done. And so if a ground, bad ground happens with the ECU and it glitches, uh, it's actually possible to r overwrite a section of the operating system software in this ECU and corrupt the firmware, and that's exactly what's happened here. Now, there are some recovery options uh, to get around this on the later versions of the ECUs, um, but since I have the chip burner here and everything else, I'm just going to go ahead and write back the correct firmware uh, to the ECU. So let's go ahead and do that and see what happens. All right, so this is our chip burning software. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and load the ROM that we want to burn to it. So there is our firmware file, just like what we saw earlier. And if you don't quite understand what you're looking at, um, the data on the left is hexadecimal. Um, so this is a base 16 numbering system, 0 through 9, A through F. And that's used to represent different combinations of bits, zeros and ones. And on the right is the ASCII column. So it takes that hex data and translates it into human readable text. So if there's any strings in there, like this, uh, you know, AEM 15 version number here, the gems trademark and stuff like that, uh, that's actually easily decipherable by a human. So it's kind of handy having that column there. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and program this into the chip. So we'll just ID error. So that might happen if the pads aren't contacting correctly. So let me pop this and wiggle it around a little bit. Okay. So it should go now. There it goes. And that's it. And it does do a verify, but I like to go back and manually verify. So I'll hit the verify button. And what this does is this reads the contents of the chip back and compares them with the data that's in the buffer. And our verify was successful. So now that our operating system software is burned back to the chip, let's go ahead and pop this back into the ECU and see if it works. So very special care has to be taken with this. If you put this in backwards, it will fry things. Um, there is no actual pin 1 indication on here. The front of the chip socket was actually cut out to allow this IC on the board to sit in that place. Um, but I probed out where pin 1 is uh, after taking it apart to verify that. Alright, so now that our chip's in, since we're already set up on the oscilloscope, I'm just going to go ahead and go back and probe that reset line.
and see if it resets repeatedly. So let's do that. All right, so we're back to our 10 millisecond time base. So let me grab our positive wire from the bench supply. Make sure there's nothing that's going to short out the board. Okay, so we'll go ahead and power that on. And I'll bring my scope probe over. And we're going to hit the reset line. And it looks like it's high. Uh, what's my volts per division? Okay. So let me zoom out a bit. So let's go to like a hundred millisecond time base. Reprobe here. And it looks like our reset line is staying high, so the CPU is actually running at this point. And we could probably verify that further by hitting a couple of these lines. Oh yeah, lots of data going through there. So it's actually reading the operating system off of the chip and executing that code, and that's what we see in that. So if I was to actually zoom in a bit with the time base, like if we go back to 10 milliseconds, maybe that's enough time. No, not even. You still barely see it. Let's go down to... 100 microseconds. And now we're just starting to see that data take shape. If I keep zooming in, you can actually see the high and low transitions. And um, as it reads data, it's not going to be an exact pattern. So uh, that's good. That's a good sign. Um, so at this point, we're ready to go ahead and reassemble the ECU and see if we have serial communication. Since everything's running like it's supposed to, I'm going to go ahead and unsolder our wires here. So we won't need these anymore. Cool. And then we take our adapter board do our best to plug this back into here without bending anything. This connector is is terrible. It really is. This is not how I would how I would design this thing for sure. All right, so with that fully seated, you can see we have a foam block here that keeps the ROM chip in place. So Let's go ahead and uh, plug this into the car before putting the case on it and verify that we have serial communication. Okay, we have our ECU plugged in. So I'm going to go up here to the laptop. I'm going to turn the key on. Yeah, just a second. We have fuel pump prime, that's a good sign. And we are now connected, so our ECU is back up and running. Awesome. And we're done. This old girl will live to fight another day. Alright, well, let's see if our changes worked. Good. So as you can see, we do vehicle electronics very well here. So if you have a vehicle electronics problem or project of your own, Come hit us up at Finish Line Industries. We'll see you soon.